Linux Luddites, episode 82, for the 11th of July, 2016. Hello and welcome to Linux Luddites, the show where we try all the latest free and open source software and then decide that we like the old stuff better. I'm Joe. I'm Jesse. And I'm Paddy. And what a time to be alive. And I think it's been a long time since I could say that without any sarcasm whatsoever, but what with the goings on in politics at the moment and also the football, it really is a fantastically interesting time. So let's hope that today's show can match up. After the news and with snaps and flat packs all the rage we'll be looking at another application sandboxing technology that, unlike those other two, is already mature and works well today. And later, we'll take SUSE Studio for a spin to see how easy, or otherwise, it can be to create your own distro. So with all that's cramming into the next hour and a half, should we get on with it? Yeah, let's do the news. First up in the news then, what is being touted as the end of an era, and that is that fewer and fewer Linux distributions will be supporting 32-bit x86 hardware going forward. And this is mostly being prompted by Ubuntu announcing that 16.10 onwards will not have a 32-bit desktop image, although 16.04, which is the LTS, is going to be supported for five years with 32-bit images. So it's not like this is going away overnight. This is more of a kind of long-term thing. And I don't know how I feel about this. I used to cling on to 32-bit images, even on 64-bit hardware, but since Chrome has gone 64-bit only, not that I use it very often, but just to have that available. For me, I don't have any 32-bit hardware anymore. I don't really care about this. Yes, because you've fobbed all your 32-bit hardware onto people like me and Paddy. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. But I, th- I think you're you're right there. It's it's very much being prompted this news article because Ubuntu are talking about it. Whereas Fedora 24 and OpenSUSE Leap have already gone to 64-bit only, and so this is just sort of saying you know those two big distributions, and now you know Ubuntu, arguably the biggest distribution, is talking about it. But we, we should remember that 32 is going to be supported until 2021 because of the long-term support. So it's not like we need to you know panic and, and start switching stuff over, but. I mean, I had a bit of a, a chat on Google Plus about this and the fact that if the the servers are going to be 64-bit only, that sort of makes a lot of old hardware redundant because I, for myself, certainly, I've taken an old PC and used it as a server because it doesn't need to be super fast and that's 32-bit. And so it'd be a bit annoying that, that what is a good sort of uh, uh, background position for old hardware to take won't be available in the sort of you know medium future. Yeah, that's what really strikes me about this sort of thing as well. I mean, the 32 versus 64-bit argument always ignores things like those old boxes and into old industrial control hardware that's probably running obsolete software. Um, I guess probably they do so because often that's Windows software or DOS software they're running, and Linux was still fairly new when 64-bit was first introduced. I mean, it's only been around for a decade or so. Um but there's still a lot of it out there, to be honest. But I've got to say, I think a large part of the problem here is the usual one, that it's devs always run the shiniest, newest hardware and prefer coding against that. And that's also why we see increasing bloat in toolkits, applications, and stuff like that. And newer software sort of needs more resources to run because the focus of devs is on their needs rather than the needs of the user. Yeah, but come on, who's actually got a 32-bit machine? I mean, the only word that keeps coming up is netbooks, and there are a lot of 32-bit Atom netbooks still out there. But apart from those, I don't see many people. I mean, even if you go and buy a a cheap laptop, and any time in the last five years, that has been 64-bit capable. Yeah, I'm not disagreeing with you, but... I just find it disappointing and rather sad that we're contributing to producing so much waste in the world simply because we are allowing hardware manufacturers and software developers then support hardware manufacturers to keep us on a constant upgrade cycle where there's perfectly good kit out there that is being 
stuck in a landfill somewhere. It's just very depressing. Yeah, but the point you're saying there is that all uh, Linux distributions will be stopping 32-bit. But I, I see it as maybe there'll be sort of niches. Like at the moment, we have niches for low-power hardware. We class it as that. It would be low-power and 32-bit. You know, maybe there'll be tiling window managers and a, and a stable kernel. And people would, you know, build distributions that are 32-bit only. And that would, you know, as time goes on, it become more and more niche. And maybe they'd eventually die away because 32-bit becomes so far in the far in the distant past. But, you know, that it's not like everyone is going to stop supporting 32-bit. It's just going to be, well, niche. Yeah, and also you have to take into consideration power consumption, which has come up on this show before when we talked about similar things. If you've got an ancient old 32-bit only, you know, P4 or something, the, the power that that is going to use compared to the actual computing power that it's going to give you, you may as well use a little arm board or something and you'll get a similar performance, if not better, for a fraction of the the power usage, the, the electricity usage. Oh, fair enough. I'll just sit here chuntering into my beard then quietly. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you are a dev, uh, as Paddy mentioned there, and you're you know building various bits of software, Ubuntu have come out with a, a competition to try and make as many apps uh, convergible, is, is that the word? Adaptable to the various different platforms. So they've, they've got a, a hashtag and basically they've got a new SDK with um, a new component called adaptive page layout, which means that if you're using your application on a phone, it will look one way when you, you know, plug it into a monitor, or I think they've recently showed even wireless um, monitor convergence. And those various different form factors, it allows the the application to adapt and, and look different. So they've got this competition, there's a hashtag for it, and you can win uh, various Ubuntu phones and Bluetooth speakers and things like this. Yeah, fabulous prizes such as the Ubuntu M10 tablet. Yeah, I also did look, and at the time of recording this, I looked at the Converge Me Please is, is the hashtag, and there are currently three hashtags of that well these things take time don't they you can't expect software to be developed overnight so hopefully this will do well and we've always said haven't we that the the main problem with the ubuntu touch and the whole convergence thing is the lack of applications and so this kind of initiative is what they need to be doing they need to get devs on board they need to get more applications developers 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 basically. So I, I think this is a good idea of them to do it. And, you know, you can be snarky if you want about the M10 tablet, but I'd certainly like to win one. So if I was a dev, I'd, I'd certainly give this a go. So you run Android? Uh, I, I may possibly flash it with Android. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All right, let's move on very rapidly then, I guess. Um, there's been a number of flash drive based operating systems pushed out in the past. We've spoken about in the show. And also a number of secure USB keys. And the next story we're going to be talking about is something that combines both of these ideas. And it's a product called Secure K. And it's an OS that's on a stick that is theoretically encrypted until you unlock it by entering your passcode, which actually is on a keyboard on the stick itself. And you can then boot off it and theoretically work in a secure manner. It's been developed by a London-based company called Monkey, which apparently is pronounced Monkey. And it's due to launch in October. C- can you just explain why you've used the word theoretically a couple of times in that? Um, because it isn't out yet. Nobody knows much about it apart from a very slick promo video. And I have to say, I actually quite like the promo video. It's, it's a little trite, but I think it makes a reasonable case for the product, um, both for personal users and also as something they seem to be pitching quite hard for is a customized version for corporate users. But we don't know anything about it. We don't know what the OS is, as far as I can tell, or how you're going to get updates or anything like that. Um, So theoretical is all it is at the moment. But I think it looks quite promising. And the combination of the two things, sort of an updatable Linux, and I'm assuming it is going to be a Linux-based system on a key that you can carry around that's actually secure because you have to physically type your password in on the key itself, I think could be quite appealing. Well, you say that we don't know much about it. It does say on the website that it is Linux-based. And um, so I wanted to know about it. So I dug around the website for a while, and I couldn't find any information what destroys it. And there was mention of uh, Microsoft Office as well. And I thought, hmm, I'd love to know more about this. And then right at the bottom of it, there's a phone number. I was like, why not? Give them a ring. And uh, even though it's a London-based phone number, it gave me uh, a European dial tone. And then an Italian bloke picked up, hello. Not hello, 
this is, you know, a monkey or secure K or anything like that. And so I, I, I wouldn't say lied. I somewhat pretended to be in charge of 500 or 600 people <laughs> who might want to buy one of these. You, you do have about that many bits of hardware lying around. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I, I dug down into it. He wouldn't give me any idea about prices. He said, oh, you have to email and stuff. So I don't know about that. But he told me that it was Debian based. So I said, oh, okay, well, what is it? Debian 7, Debian 8? Uh, it's one of the latest versions of Debian, he said. Mm, okay. And I said, what about Office then? You know, are we looking at just LibreOffice or, or you know, are we going to be having proper Microsoft Office? And he said, oh, yeah, well, it, it's, it's got Microsoft Office. I said, oh, how is that going to work then? Is that with Wine or is that, you know, some sort of other virtualization? And the bottom line is he didn't know the the technical details but he said that they've been working for several months to make sure that that is integrated properly and it is through some sort of virtualization um and you are going to get proper microsoft office on it so there you go a proper undercover journalism excellent work um so yeah as paddy pointed out it's got zero to nine little buttons on it so you can dial in a pin and, and unlock and it's got lights to show whether it's locked or not and it's interesting they're they're trying to push it for enterprise because uh if we're going for little stories um i actually went to my work it's quite a big uh engineering company and said you know i can run linux on my on a usb pen why am i having to lug a laptop round? whereas when i go to site or go to clients offices why can't i have my um work distribution on a usb pen because i know that windows 10 now does that and you know, we could just plug into one of their PCs and not have to carry a laptop everywhere. And they, the IT department got back to me and sort of said, yeah, this is a good idea, chat, chat, chat. However, updating and making sure that you don't lose it is is a real problem. I think their real issue was was how do you guarantee that it's being kept updated? Because it's the same with when I make a USB pen that I want to just carry in my bag. It's in your bag for six, nine months before you are at someone's house or your own house that you want to use it. And then before you know it, it's it's either been superseded by a distribution update or you need to sit there for 20 minutes while it downloads all the updates and things. And you actually, it's a bit more dangerous by having a, something that isn't regularly used, whether or not it will be kept up to date and have all the various security patches. Yeah, but the idea of this is that it will be used on a regular basis, isn't it? That you might use it on one computer most of the time. And then you have the option to take it elsewhere. So rather than just that USB stick that's sitting in your bag most of the time, it, it is actually actively used. So that that is the the simple way to get around that update issue, I think. Well, it'll be interesting to see what they do come out with if it is in October, as they promise. I mean, I think the form factor I mean, is it's nothing unusual, but it's n- nothing I've seen anyone else come out with. And it just, I think, would make it a very appealing mass market product. So we'll wait and see. Well, I'm concerned that it's Debian-based, but I don't see any source code on their website. So uh, they may well be in violation of the GPL. So we'll have to keep an eye on that one as well. But let's move on then and talk about the iFi memory card, which is uh, an SD card with Wi-Fi built into it. So it can give you Wi-Fi functionality in a camera or device that doesn't have it. So the first generation of these came out in about 2007, I think, and were phased out around 2012. But they did actually keep selling them until about March 2015, which is just over a year ago. And as with these things, they get into kind of unofficial resellers and on eBay and stuff. So you could probably still buy one now. And they are going to cease support for it, basically. So they're just going to pretty much brick it well not quite it, some functions may work possibly but they can't guarantee that they will and so it's just another i mean does this count as internet of things i suppose it just about it's another example of companies abandoning old well not even very old hardware in favor of new stuff and their solution is oh have 20 percent off a new product well if i had one i'd be pretty miffed about this i think yeah, the issue here is the usual one that it's not that the hardware is stopping working, it's that it relies on a server based software stack as well, and they can just pull the plug on that any time and the hardware's useless. Yeah, open standards. We keep banging on about that, and there's a reason for it. If this thing had been using open standards, then it would be potentially useful to people because someone else could come along and offer a similar service or if you know there was an open source server implementation that would make it work 
whereas now it's just basically useless to people. All right, well, it wouldn't be a new segment if we don't hit one of the uh, the big players in the tech world. Uh, Amazon, who seem to be putting their fingers and toes into various different bits and bobs. And, and we did t- cover the massive failure that was the Amazon phone. Uh, and they've actually now not got back into the phone market, but they are trying to sell phones, but this time other people's phones. And the way they're doing it this way is by giving a $50 discount off of two phones, the Blue R1 HD, I haven't heard of it either, and the Moto G, the fourth generation. So the Blue is $100 down to $50, and the Moto is $200 down to $150. And the reason you're getting a discount is that the phones are shipped with Amazon adverts and promoted items from the website on the lock screen. So you get adverts basically while your phone isn't being used and you know, the moment you go to open up, you'll see these adverts and I suppose potentially click on them. Accidentally click on them, probably. Yeah, yeah. Combine it with a, a one tap buy and it, it could be dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is fair enough, I think. Why not do this if you don't mind seeing adverts? And some people don't. I saw someone on the tube the other day with a Kindle that was uh, had adverts on the lock screen. Right, okay. I'm just going to interrupt you there. So I I bought my mum a Kindle for Christmas just gone. And, you know, I love my Kindle and I wanted to share it. She likes books as well. And I opened it up and there's this thumping great Amazon advert that you have to click away from, you know, find the right place on the screen to click. And then it gets you down to the normal Kindle. And I was completely bemused by this. And I looked at what, what it is I'd bought exactly this same promotion. It was, you know, $20 cheaper, pounds cheaper, obviously, uh, than the main Kindle would be. And I had not realized, it didn't say in the, in the adverts that are on Amazon for these phones, it's very clear what they're doing. But this did not say, it just had like, uh, you know, like an acronym that sort of meant with adverts, ha ha ha, you didn't know this. And so I phoned them up and said, look, I've bought this Kindle. Uh, I didn't expect it to have adverts on. And they said, well, you know, you have bought this one, blah, 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 but we'll allow you to get rid of them because you were ignorant and, and you phoned up sort of thing. And within a minute or two, reboot the Kindle, adverts were off. So they are good enough to understand that they have, I think it's one of those things where Amazon know they've missold those in under sort of, you know, shady kind of conditions. So they're happy to take the adverts off. And my mum now has a normal Kindle. But with this one, I think they are so clearly selling it with adverts that no one's going to be able to take them off in, in the same way that I did. What does that tell you, though, that story about how much control they've got over your device? It's not even your device at that point, is it? Well, no. And, and I mean, you know, there was the news stories about the fact that a guy had all of his books taken off Kindle because, you know, he didn't pay something or got into an argument with Amazon or something. And yeah, you do have to realise that they're not on your device, they're being taken from Amazon. And as soon as Amazon takes them off their server under your account, that's them gone off your device as well. You know, they're, they're very tightly linked. So I know you, Paddy, have bought um, some of the medium to low end motos, you know, based on the fact that they, they work perfectly fine, but are a cheap price point. Does this sort of promotion to make them even cheaper appeal to you? Absolutely not. No, um, I can't be doing with advertising at all. I wonder if they've got unlocked bootloaders, though. Can you stick Cyanogen mod on them? Well, I mean, Moto you can unlock, certainly. I don't know about this this other one I've never heard of. You've not heard of Blue? They uh, they do a lot of cheap, low-end phones. I suppose you're not really interested in that sort of thing. No, no, I haven't heard of Blue. Obviously, I've heard of Moto. I own one. <laughs> oh, yeah, your mysteriously etched one that you won't tell us what's written on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and do you know what? Ages ago, you said, how are you ever going to sell that on? And I said, oh, no, it's the greatest phone ever. Why would I ever sell it? And that's going to be a bit long in the tooth. I'm like, oh, how, how am I going to sell this? <laughs> <laughs> Take a sharpie to it. Problem solved. Well, while we ponder that issue, um, let's carry on talking about Android. And a way of cracking full disk encryption on Snapdragon-powered phones has been found, and a Python exploit script is widely available. Now, previously, it's not been practical to brute force the Android encryption uh, because it uses a combination of a generated PIN or password together with a RSA key that's actually created by the device. Um, so it's very much like you would store passwords and such like on the web, you know, where you've got a salt and a password and you hash the two together before you store it away. But a researcher has now found out a way to access the system-derived key within the uh, Qualcomm Secure Execution Environment, meaning that whoever's trying a cracky phone only has to brute force the user-generated portion of it because they've already got the other bit available to them. Now, there's obviously an interplay here between the hardware and software that means even as the software is patched to prevent the current attack 
the hardware on existing devices will remain vulnerable going forwards. But this presumably only applies to people who have used the full disk encryption on Android. Most people don't bother with that, do they? I don't think they do, no. I don't know anybody who has got it set up. Um, I mean, it's not been default out of the box previously, has it? I think it is with version 6. Yeah, yeah, that rings a bell. But how many people have got version 6? A few tech heads, and that's pretty much it. Everyone else is stuck on like 4 point something. Just as a, as a quick poll, do either of you have uh, full Android encryption? No, I'm scared that I'll forget passwords and be locked out. I heard a horror story from a friend who was playing with various custom ROMs, encrypted his SD card, then flashed a new ROM and lost the relevant keys. And now it's that SD card is basically useless. It's a 64 gig card full of photos and videos of his kids that he's just put in a drawer somewhere in the hope that one day he'll be able to uh, unencrypt it and get that data back. And after that, I thought, mm, no, no, I don't really fancy that. Yeah, I don't either. Mind you, I don't even have a, a pin or anything on my lock screen. I don't have a lock screen. I just have a quick swipe. But um, I think we're going to have a big digital dark age, really, aren't we? Because there's a lot of this sort of thing going on, and people will be losing data. And it's not like the olden days where you could show your grandkids' photo albums and what have you. There's going to be stuff vanishing all the time. Well, yeah, I mean, people generally don't do very good backups, do they? They back up to the cloud and that's pretty much it and generally speaking people take a load of photos and they just sit on a hard drive somewhere until that laptop dies and then those photos are just gone forever because they don't have the technical skills or and know how to actually get them off there I, I don't know i mean is google and the likes of apple going to be around indefinitely with these cloud backups because at least those companies are being run um, you know, those departments have been run by people who know what they're doing with um, RAID and redundancy and all that kind of stuff. I have faith in Google and Apple that they will keep people's photos and videos backed up as long as they've got the money to do it. But what I don't have faith in is that they will necessarily be around as companies forever. So you might be right, Paddy. Yeah, we might get to a stage where, yeah, instead of, I mean, I've got photos of me as a kid. Um, that are you know actual hard copies that might be a bit faded or whatever but you can still see them whereas yeah maybe um this current generation they'll just end up not having no memories or you know no record of their their childhoods got a, f a fairly bleak end but let's, let's, let's not just end it there i do I, it's just listening to you talking about that i just wonder how many copies of all of our you know a photo let's say Google has, like you say, they must have RAID and redundancy and double and triple redundancy because the moment they start losing people's photos, their entire credibility as, as a photo store has gone. And so I, I just wonder, it'd be interesting to know, you know, do they have six copies everywhere? And, and think of the size of the, the hard disks that must be there to store this hundreds of terabytes of data. Well, I would imagine the likes of Google have got good compression algorithms and have got ways to keep your data relatively small, but it still must be an awful lot of copies of things. And they must have, as you say, a lot of hard drives spinning somewhere and probably some tapes. You never know. But speaking of Google, they have released a new tool which lets you see what they know about you or a, a f let you peek behind the curtain, I suppose, and see a, a tiny bit of what they know about you. And it's a thing called My Activity. And you can see all the Google searches you've been doing and alarmingly, a lot of the websites you've been going to as well. And it really does show just quite how much they know about you. Or as I said, it gives you a glimpse of that. Yeah, I'm just uh, looking at it now. And it shows you today we've got 70 items and there's little stats on whether they came from Chrome or a search, your Android phone, uh, play music. So obviously I assume there'd be a whole list of those if you've got other things that you've looked at, maybe photos, you know, Fitbit, things like this, or was Google Fit. And then it, it breaks it down as to what things you've looked at straight from Google, the search page. And there it's sort of arranged like little cards. And so you can you can see all these things. And it was something I was looking for the other day. It was I think maybe a restaurant at a location. So it's a chain of restaurants. And I searched the location, independently searched the restaurant. And the next time I went to go and search for something while stood in that area of London, it's combined the, the restaurant and the location, thinking that that was where I wanted to go and what I wanted to do. And it's, you know, it's this sort of, this 
information they're pooling about you and multiple searches and using algorithms to combine them and say, oh, hang on a minute, this is a thing and a place. He's now at that place. He probably wants this thing. And it, it's, you know, on one side of the coin, it's very useful. And on the other side of the coin, it's very creepy. Well, I remember when we talked about Google I.O., that was my takeaway from it, that everything that they have brought out and everything they're going to be bringing out is to make your life easier and more convenient, but at the cost of even more data that they're gathering on you and combining. And stuff like this, my activity thing, really does just show it just they know so much about you. And I can see why people like Phelim, who we had on talking about a Google-less Android, I can see why he wants to do that and not use Google services. Of course, sorry, I'm just, as, as you're talking about it, I'm just looking through some other things. And it shows me when they know when I used Pocket Casts, my podcast player on my phone, and at what time it was. And it tells you why they've tracked this and, and what setting it is that you've got on your Android phone that allows them to take this information. It's, yeah, it's bizarre, the depth. Because I thought when we were talking about this last fortnight and I was saying about taking my photos off of Google, I thought that was quite useful to be able to extract the photos and their metadata out of Google. It was, it was, you know, I thought that gave me an insight into what they knew and, and how they did it. But this is definitely the next step. Well, if it's not Google knowing stuff about you, it's probably Facebook, isn't it? Well, yeah, exactly. And there's many European authorities who are, are looking to stop Facebook trampling over people's privacy. And recently, Belgium um, put in a case against facebook because of the the tracking cookies that they have and these tracking cookies are ones that while you might not have a facebook account you can click on a like uh, from a different website that allows you to you know thumb up various things or you can maybe just visit facebook because someone sent you a link to a photo and even if you don't have a facebook account they would put a cookie on your computer and then track your subsequent usage of the internet and belgium was saying this isn't this isn't on we need to stop this however they've actually had to go back on that because Facebook isn't based in Belgium. It's got its headquarters in Europe within Ireland. And so they're not within the Belgian jurisdiction. Yeah, and that's really why I put this story in here. Is the question of jurisdiction is going to become an increasing one, I think, as nation states sort of cede control to the Global Corporate Congress. And if you don't know about that, go and watch Continuum, fine series. I was wondering how long you could go in this show without getting into European politics, Paddy. I figured this was in here because of Brexit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's so I can pimp continuum because I like that show. Um, but no, I mean, yeah, with nation states, you, theoretically, you know who make the law and who enforces the law. And the whole issue with these transnational corporations is that the world is changing drastically, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I also wonder if Ireland brought this same case against Facebook – I doubt they would because they make a lot of money out of these international corporations that have their headquarters in Ireland because of you know tax reasons and stuff. I wonder whether they would be able to say, oh, no, no, this is our sub-department. Our real headquarters is in America and you don't have any jurisdiction over there. Like, How many times can they dodge and duck and weave because where is the headquarters? And it would therefore require someone else to take this up. And can I just bring up the point here that if you go to Facebook – and then complain that they are using the fact that you've gone there against you, then it's your fault. Like you, you shouldn't have any right to complain. If you click a link that is to Facebook, then that's your problem, not theirs. Just don't visit Facebook if you don't want them to track you. And if you don't mind them tracking you, then, you know, log into it every day like most people do. Yeah, well... I see your point. The thing is, is that if someone from your family has sent you a link to their holiday photo and you just want to look at it, you don't necessarily know. You haven't signed up to Facebook. You don't necessarily know that they're going to be tracking you. But also, let's say you get to the bottom of an article and you want to show your respect for that article, so you click on the little like button. That's not going to the Facebook site. That's you know trying to promote an article or a writer and they're trying to gather Facebook likes because that means that their stuff within Facebook gets better promoted. You're not even going to their site. You're just trying to help that person out. And then before you know it, you've got a, a cookie on your computer that's tracking you again. Yeah, I think friends don't let friends use Facebook is the motto, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. And it's not only that. I mean, it, these like buttons that are on pages are already sending 
data to Facebook, even if you don't click on it. And I think that that is uh, the responsibility of the the other websites putting those Facebook like buttons on there in the first place. And you should avoid sites that do that. I say that quickly looking at our site to make sure that we don't do that. Which, we uh, don't. Almost, we don't. We don't. So well done, Paddy. Um, but I remember the H, I think it was the H, may they rest in peace, developed, or was it Heiser anyway? They, they developed this thing where it was a sort of two-click system where you had grayed out Facebook and Twitter and stuff buttons. And if you wanted to engage with them, you had to click it on to start with and then click like. And that seemed to be a much more responsible way of doing things to me rather than just tracking everyone by default. It would be grayed out and not loaded. So Facebook wouldn't know you'd looked at that page unless you actively engage with it. And I'd like to see that more, I think. I think that's the the better solution here. Yeah, well, taking that approach certainly didn't do the H any favours by way of income, did it? Because they stopped existing. Um, another company that that won't be happening to, I guess, in the short term at least, is Mozilla. And although we've knocked them in the past with some really iffy product decisions, uh, we know we're not even going to talk about the supposedly educational emoji encryption tool, which <laughs> <laughs> I guess both you guys saw. Um, they really do have, seem to have their head screwed on when it comes down to business. And Marissa Mayer who I'm sure will go down as one of the most arrogant and incompetent CEOs of all time. <laughs> Making friends all over the place, Paddy. <laughs> I do my best. I do my best. Well, I mean, this is a woman that's brought Yahoo to its knees. And so desperate was she to try and take on Google, who, if everyone remembers, was her former employer. She allowed a clause in the Yahoo revenue sharing contract with Mozilla to state that if Yahoo changed ownership, Mozilla could actually walk away from the deal continue picking up $375 million a year for the next three years. That's over a billion dollars, man. How did they manage to get that deal? That's ridiculous. I mean, incompetent isn't even the word here. She should be, like, fired immediately. Have you seen what her severance is? I dread to think how much. Well, I remember reading back on um, CNBC a couple of months ago, that she was due for a $55 million payout should she actually be pushed out the door or leave. Well, that's not much, is it, really, compared to the billion dollars she's cost them. I mean, it, yeah, your assessment that she's just dragging them under, I think, is fair. But well done, Mozilla, is all I can say. Whoever they have got doing their business side of things is a genius to get basically a billion dollars for nothing. You cannot knock that, can you? Yeah, and I guess the, because they'll have walked away... They could be looking for another um, sponsor or someone else that they could tie in their search providing with and therefore effectively get paid twice for those three years. Well, yeah, I mean, presumably that's what they're going to do. Well, maybe they won't. It depends on who buys Yahoo, doesn't it? But yeah, they could get paid twice. If they go back to Google, they'll get less money for their actual searches from Google, but it'll be buoyed by this billion dollars over the next three years. So fair play to them. I mean, let's hope that they can use all of that ridiculous amount of money to do some good and uh, actually make Firefox work properly and maybe even bring back Thunderbird. No, no, they're going to be bringing out new apps and different little things and then letting them drop off. I think there's going to be loads and loads of random things they try and uh, see which one sticks. Mozilla Luddites, anyone? Yeah, remember when Firefox was good, eh? Do you remember when it was good, Paddy? <laughs> <laughs> I generally date myself these days when I'm chatting to people by saying I remember the last good Radiohead album. <laughs> what, OK Computer? OK Computer, yeah. Yeah, I thought as much. Anyway, right, well, let's, uh, let's move it on. And let's end the news with a couple of posts on Medium. And the first one is from Nick Nguyen, I think that's how you say it, who's the Vice President of Firefox Product at Mozilla talking about the context graph, which is a rather confusing thing, especially if you take this article where the, the metaphor of a forest and a meadow is used. And I think to say that he labours the metaphor is rather an <laughs> understatement. <laughs> I'm surprised he didn't start talking about mowing the meadow and chopping trees. It was, it was terrible. Yeah, he makes your metaphors look uh, good, Jesse. <laughs> oh. um, 
But the long and the short of it is that it's kind of uh, context-aware browsing, I suppose, where it is going to kind of predict the kind of thing that you might want to look at based on what you've looked at before. And um, he talks about the biggest button on a browser is the back button, and we want to change that, and it wants to be the forward button, which is, I suppose, a, a new approach. And I, I don't know how to feel about this, really. It, On the one hand, it will probably make it more interesting to kind of view content. But on the other hand, it, it's this idea of someone else telling me what to look at, making it more like TV rather than a library where you go in and you just find what you want to look at. And this follows on to another Medium post, which is from about a year ago by an Iranian-Canadian blogger called, oh, how am I going to say this, uh, Hossein Direction. I have absolutely butchered that. Anyway, but where he was talking about how in Iran, in uh, almost 10 years ago, blogging really took off and then he went to prison for a while and he came out and then suddenly it was all about social media and the importance of the hyperlink had just diminished significantly and people are kind of locked into these social networks where they have a stream of content rather than kind of finding their own content through you know the the old kind of spiral that you'd go into you'd start researching one thing and then you click links and click links and click links and then you'd end up all over the place whereas now people generally are kind of stuck on one social media site. And so it, you basically got Mozilla saying that that is a good approach and the old approach is wrong. And uh, given the ethos of this show, I would have thought that at least you, Paddy, are in favour of the old way of doing things rather than this new proposed way that Mozilla wants to do. Yeah, very much so. I mean, I obviously set the juxtaposition here and sort of remembered the old article from the Iranian guy I mean, what Mozilla are talking about here sounds very much like stumble upon to me, and I've I've got to say the cynic in me thinks it just seems like a great monetization strategy, where like stumble upon they'll be able to include paid for items in the sort of suggested things that they they throw up in your browser, so it looks like another money making wall garden to me, basically the same as the existing money making wall gardens they're criticising in the article. It's funny that phrase you use there, throw up in your browser. It seems pretty apt to me. <laughs> what about you, Jesse? You're the progressive one. What do you think? I don't think that even though, uh, let's say Google, for example, pulls together so much information about me, about so many different things that I do and find interesting. I, like, I use the Google Now cards and they sort of generally are what I'm interested in from a, a news point of view. I don't think I hit the web with or I like to think I don't hit the web with as predictability as you could get from knowing my past of what I what I like. It's difficult to go around, but it you know if I'm looking for uh, new headphones, I'm not necessarily looking for the new headphones to replace exactly what I had. I might have changed my mind and be looking for a different type or a different price range, or you know want to look for reviews from different places. And I I just don't think that they can gather enough information to predict what your forward button is going to be of what you want to look at. I, I just can't see that happening to a degree that's good enough for me to browse the web and enjoy just pressing forward, wildly hoping that it's going to be something interesting. Now, Stumble Upon, I used uh, a few years ago and was happy that maybe I had you know, 20 minutes to kill or was just wanted, you know, my mind to sort of go different places. And I would enjoy the randomness of having put in a whole load of things that I'm interested in, whether it be photography or technology or, you know, computers, bits of bobs. And it would just be shooting me all over the internet. I don't want that when I'm going to look for something very specific. I want to know that my, I'm driving that search. So I don't see it being... I don't see them being able to get enough information about me to predict exactly what I want to look at. Yeah, one of the things there, though, is you're talking about an active experience where you're actively driving things. And I think a lot of the consumption of the web these days is very passive, and it is more like television, as you were suggesting earlier, Joe. And people are just using it for entertainment and are quite happy to be led by the nose around the place. 
Yeah, so the Google Now Card type experience where I'm waiting for my tea to brew, so I just flick over to Google Cards or or flick through Google Plus or something and go, oh yeah, these are things that I've already told I'm interested in or people that I'm following. And so it just immediately shows me interesting things. I, I, I see the difference you're talking about there. Okay, but this doesn't have to be a binary situation, does it? You don't have to only use this Mozilla thing. Take Twitter, for example. Since they changed their design recently to material design or whatever, and you have to swipe, or you can swipe twice to get to your notifications and then desperately refresh them in the hope that someone has uh, said something interesting to you, and then back again to your timeline, you go through this thing called Moments, which I had previously ignored, whereas now, recently, uh, with all this Brexit business and the football, I've been kind of looking at it every day. And... It seems to me like a reasonably good way to get an idea of what's happening with things. I'm learning about tennis, which I don't care about, but whatever, and some ridiculous celebrity stuff like Taylor Swift and whatnot that I really, really don't care about. But then again, you know, it's a way of finding out some information. And that alongside my other ways of doing things, it seems to be supplementary And so what I'm getting at here is maybe this forward button from Mozilla, whatever it ends up being called, could supplement existing ways of browsing the web and the internet as a whole. And it doesn't have to necessarily replace it. Yeah, the more we've been discussing this, I I see it's not trying to predict exactly what it is I'm looking for. They're just trying to give you nice things that you already know you want to talk about or look at or read. Like you say with Twitter, and I assume there's maybe you can tick on and off whether you're interested in new music or you can tick on and off whether you're interested in sport and things like you can on Google Cards. Is that possible? Uh, It doesn't seem to be with Twitter. I've never dug into it too far, to be honest. So is it just sort of a list of like what's hot and therefore the things that are trending? That sort of thing. And it's like 10 tweets to wake up to and 10 tweets to go home. And there's always one that's the front pages as well of the newspapers, which I quite like to see what the uh, propaganda machine is spewing out today. Um, and just little things like that, um, what's going on in politics. And, you know, it's it's very light and very um, shallow, but at least it gives you a taste of what you might want to research a bit more thoroughly. But, I mean, if you really think about it, Mozilla have got all this money. It's not really working out browser-wise. Maybe they should spend some more money making Firefox better. And we have talked about previously some of their efforts to do that. But surely they need to try and innovate. They need to try new things in the hope that it will improve the web and the open web. And to get just bogged down with the old style browser isn't going to let them do that, is it? So they have to try these things, I think. And even if it fails, hopefully they'll throw enough at the wall that some of it will stick and be good. Paddy mentioned at the top of the show that we've talked about Snappy and Flatpak and AppImage and all these new universal packaging systems. And they attempt to solve various problems by delivering software in a new way and generally trying to sandbox that software. Well, there are existing ways to sandbox applications on Linux, and one of them is called FireJail. Yeah, so FireJail is quite a a simple application that you install as normal from your repo. We can just ignore all those other uh, distribution methods that Joe's just mentioned. And it's really simple to use. It's just a case of saying FireJail and the application that you want to run. And it will, as as Joe points out, run that application within a sandbox using Linux namespaces and other features already available in the kernel. And it means that where you get compromises in things like maybe Firefox or Chrome or whatever browser you're using, it will keep that sandbox in one place and it won't then or can't then get into the rest of your system. It's also able to produce a home directory, which is not your own. So when you download content, it doesn't see the rest of your file system. So that's quite useful. And you can even make one that's persistent. So if you've got maybe, as I say, if you're using your web browser and you download stuff, you can then relaunch that web browser and continue to see that the things that you've downloaded so you've described it there using the command line version which is just a case of typing fire jail and then optional arguments and then the name of the application but there is also a very simple gui for it which 
you know, it's simple, effective. It's not going to win any uh, beauty contests, but it seems to do the job. Yeah, so it's a little sort of floating window that uh, has a rather, like I say, rather odd design uh, showing the bars of a jail and then all the application icons. And it pre-launches it with ones that you've already got installed. So for example, when I loaded up, uh, it had Skype and it had Chromium. So it knew they were there. And what it actually does is it has a set of profiles. I think at the moment on the website, it's got like 30 profiles for sort of well-known applications. And it will whitelist and blacklist and restrict access to various parts of the system, whether it be networking or the file structure or things like this. So if there's maybe Firefox, for example, it will auto blacklist various sites or it will auto whitelist, uh, you know, search sites and things. But also, as I said, it, it stops it from going into your home system and it makes a temporary home file structure for you, which then gets deleted as soon as you close it again. Unless, as I say, you make it persistent with one of these uh, flags that you can start at the boot. And you can also add more applications to this GUI so it didn't pick up things that it doesn't already have profiles for. And so you can simply say, run this command, and it will f- the command being fire jail and the application that it doesn't already know about. And then it'll add it to the GUI and you just click on that as you would you know, any other icon and, and it boots it up within a, within a sandbox. Yeah, one of the things I liked about this was the actual profile mechanism is very straightforward. The profiles are text files with a very sensible syntax um, so you can actually create your own and they're, they're stored in your etc. directory. Um, and they contain lines for blacklisting access to certain parts of the file system or whitelisting access. Um, and it does good things like preventing access to other parts of your process tree as well. So if you start up a terminal, say, using Fire Jail, unless you explicitly allow it to see other things, it will only see itself um, there. So you're fairly well sandboxed away from the system. And we keep talking about sandboxing. And I think, as Joe mentioned, it uses a variety of things like namespaces, um, set comp, various aspects of, and uh, Linux capabilities as well. And it's not often you see things using Linux capabilities. I mean, it's far more widely used, the whole idea of capabilities on the BSDs. Um, so it does seem to be taking quite a comprehensive approach towards uh, new to access to your file system and memory. Yeah, what really struck me about this is that instead of trying to reinvent the wheel, like these new standards, which are just going to add further standards, what FireJail does is it just sort of builds on existing technologies. It sort of says, well, hang on, we've got a really secure operating system here. Let's use the features that we've got to secure these applications rather than trying to just add more complication and bloat to the issue. I think that's true. I mean, for me, it's probably got too many features as an actual application suite, if you like. I mean, you can do all sorts of snazzy things like uh, changing bandwidth and upload and download uh, speeds and such like for the actual applications that are in your jails. So if you wanted to, you can kick off a a download within Firefox or what have you, and then throttle back the network traffic for that particular jail uh, so that you can carry on watching Netflix in another window or something like that. So it can do all sorts of really fancy things if you want it to. And for me, that's slight overkill just from the jailing perspective, if you like. But obviously it's useful for some other people or else it wouldn't be there. Yeah, I wonder if that's maybe aimed towards more of the server side because they do promote on their website about the idea that you can run... Um, sort of server applications like Nginx in a jail, or if we call them jails now. And, you know, that they're the sorts of things that you would need from that. I don't think from maybe a, a desktop user's point of view, they're very useful. But I think that rather than having every single item on your server in a, in a new Docker container, you could just sandbox it using this. And, and I, I suspect they're the sorts of things that people who are doing sandboxing on servers would require. Yeah, I was quite surprised that Fire Tools, which is the the GUI I mentioned, is even available really, because it it doesn't strike me as massively useful on the desktop. I suppose for things like Firefox, it makes sense, but it seems to be much more geared towards the server side of things. Yeah, and I guess to kind of back that up, it has got wonderful amounts of documentation and the man page is very comprehensive and it's exactly how you'd expect a server tool to come out of the box. Well, I think we've sort of covered most of the points, and I'd just like to to highlight that on the website, the sort of first release they talk about was November 2015 for their 0.9.34, and it's actually 
gone through a external security audit in February of this year. So I think we talk about this quite a lot about the fact that while a lot of applications say they're secure or have these various sandboxing or security features, not so many of them actually get audited. So it's good that they've they've gone out of their way and made sure that an external independent auditor has looked at this and it's on their website because they they mark all the various updates and this brought in a number of bugs and issues that they had highlighted. So they made an update to, to combat those. So I think that's a, a positive side from them there. Yeah, and not altogether surprisingly, given that it uses so much of the kernel stuff, it's also GPLv2 and written in C. And overall, it seems to be a very good way, a very simple way to get jails and sandboxing working on Linux. On to the feedback then. And first of all, a huge thanks to all our monthly supporters. It's uh, really appreciated, everyone. It uh, keeps the lights on, keeps the servers going, allows us to buy little bits of hardware as and when. So yeah, thank you very much. And also, we've looked at our download numbers, and they continue to increase slowly but surely. But we were thinking that the reason that we do this show is so that as many people as possible can listen to it. And so we've got a favor to ask, and that is, can you tell someone about the show? If you're listening to us, then the chances are you like what we're doing and you think it has value. So why not spread the good word and tell someone, whether it's in real life or on social media or wherever. And, you know, the more the merrier. The more people we have listening, the better it is for everyone. And so contact details then. You can email us, show at linuxluddites.com. Or if you go to the website, you can find links to the Twitter and Google Plus and Facebook groups. And of course, you can always leave a comment on the website. Well, let's start the feedback proper with some comments from Josh Scott. And Josh said, I've observed a rather heavy emphasis on smartphones and Android, along with general news discussions and commentary about political issues surrounding FOSS. Well, there seems to be precious little treatment of desktop or practical Linux. And he's obviously talking about this show. I suppose Android is Linux too, but in my opinion, it is arguably the most mainstream commercial variety. Maybe that's why it's also the least interesting. Well, I replied to Josh and told him the old, the same old story that I tell everyone. And that is that if we were to ever have Stallman on the show, we wouldn't have to change it to GNU slash Linux Luddites because that's not all we cover. We don't only cover GNU slash Linux. We never have only done that. We've always covered all aspects of Linux and also the wider FOSS ecosystem. And as for Android, that is just the way the industry has moved. And it generally has moved away from desktop computing and laptops and where you would run standard GNU slash Linux to embedded Linux, I suppose you would say, what a lot of people call the Internet of Things and phones and tablets and ARM-based devices, basically. So we can't not cover that stuff as well. And if there's more happening in the newer areas, then inevitably we're going to have more coverage of that. I mean, this episode we did cover Fire Jail, which is very much a GNU slash Linux piece of software. You know, that is very much practical Linux. So hopefully that has appeased you a little bit, Josh, but what can I say? If there's more happening in the newer technologies, then we're going to cover more of that. I don't think we'll ever stop completely talking about GNU slash Linux because I'm sitting here using it right now to do this. But not all changes progress is kind of our tagline, but some is. And in this case, having a computer in my pocket that can do almost everything a full-size computer can do is uh, progress as far as I'm concerned. And here was me thinking you were pleased to see me. (laughs) Listening to your description there, Joe, it occurred to me that if you were to ask someone 10 years ago, what OS are they running? The answer would be Windows, Mac OS or Linux. But if you ask someone today what OS they're running, the answer will be iOS or Android. I think that like, I I think that's true. I mean, I I just thought about it, so I I can't really uh, test it. But I think that would be true of of most of the people I talk to. And that sort of describes the the way we're moving. But like you say, we all use Linux day to day. Um, I don't use it maybe every day because I have loads of things that I can do on my phone that I would have otherwise previously had to, you know, open up my laptop and, and run an application in Linux. But I can now do it on my phone. And that's just sort of the way the world is going. 
But of course, we're going to cover things that are still in Linux. And this is a, a very good show for that. You mentioned the fire jails. And later on, we're going to be talking about making your own distribution. So uh, back to the old school with this show. And Will also got in touch and said, I'm looking forward to seeing how these universal packaging systems evolve. They have the potential to change the way software on Linux is typically distributed and installed, and that could even feed back into how it's written and released. Perhaps it will become more common for projects to maintain several different release channels of varying stability and freshness once packaged versions are no longer tied to distro versions. I think there will still be a role for distros, but that role will evolve. Uh, and then he goes on to, to make, make a slight correction of me. So he says... I just wanted to point out that the packages in the official Arch repository closely track official releases of upstream packages. Every time Jesse mentioned Arch, he also referred to beta software in the same paragraph as though Arch was beta software. You can get beta versions of many packages in the AUR. So I think that's fair. I mean, obviously, when I install software that is the sort of day-to-day -day things, I pull it straight out of Pac-Man and it doesn't need to go, I don't need to look in the AUR. But when we've been talking about new software, for example, on the last show when we were talking about uh, universal packaging systems and and these snappy packages, I had to look at the AUR. Now, it's since moved into the community's repository, so I don't need to use the AUR. But when we look at software on this show, part of the reason I've moved over to the Arch is to be able to test it and play with it. And that very often means it's from the AUR. And that very often means that I'm using beta software. And so that's a lot of the software I use comes from there. So it sort of does taint me towards that because I've, you know, the software I use day to day has already been installed and I just run it. I don't need to install it every single time. So yeah, fair point, Will. Um, Arch is, you know, generally pretty stable when it comes to using just the main Arch repositories. Well, Christopher Winninger said, you missed the definition of what a sprint is. Sprints are part of the agile process and are basically just small chunks of time that you allot for tasks. It's a way of scheduling and tracking progress, whereas you made it sound like a weekend hackathon. Well, I don't think Agile itself leads to more bugs. If you think it will magically give you continuous rolling releases, then it will. Also, I find the Scrum mindset often opposes internal documentation to an extent that is not safe. Even if your product is constantly changing, having some dated documentation can save you if you lose a teammate to another job and need to get up to speed fast. So Christopher goes from talking about sprints to talking about scrums, and I have to admit I've not heard of scrums either. Is this like a group sprint? It's Docker, it's containers, it's new hotness. Well, obviously it isn't, but yeah, it, there are lots of things here, and obviously this comment's um, aimed at me and some of the criticisms I've been making about software development and particularly agile development and people just boshing stuff out, I think is how I described it last time. Um, yes, I mean, people do view these different words in different ways and the same word tends to be used for different workflows depending on who's using it. I mean, it is part of the, the new vocabulary, I'm afraid. But whilst I'm here pushing myself up to be shot down, I may as well do so again. And something I meant to mention the first time we actually started talking about this topic and then last time when we had some feedback about it was how much I think Git is actually proving to be a negative influence on the software development process for an awful lot of people. And Git obviously was designed by Linus for a specific purpose and is designed really as a maintainer's tool. But the way that people are using it for day-to-day -day projects and even one-man projects, I think is feeding into what I was talking about before, where everything is done in the open and the expectation is there will constantly be bugs there. And back in the olden days when we had things like SourceForge and you had sort of point releases put up there because you were just loading up files, as opposed to the continuous development process that Git kind of encourages you to undertake and make it visible certainly leads to some of those expectations that I've been knocking. So you think that having at least a small wall that you throw the code over is a better approach than just being totally open about it? Yeah, I do. I don't see why everyone should see any time you had a comment to your code or a semicolon or a couple of lines or whatever. And I think it just, as I say, leads to the expectation that code is constantly changing and there are constantly bugs in there and there is no such thing as a stable release. And once you get used to that, once it's past the mindset that there is nothing stable out there, then 
you just tend to shrug your shoulders and just accept that nothing is stable out there, even though it doesn't have to be that way. Well, I get the feeling that a lot of our listeners are going to disagree with you. I'm sure they are, because a lot of people use Git, and a lot of people use Git if they admit it to themselves because it's trendy, because that's what Linux invented, and therefore, oh, we've got to follow the leader. And I'm sorry, it's not necessarily the right tool for the job. I mean, it is the right tool for certain very large projects, and particularly for maintainers, as I say. It was designed for maintainers, not for coders, and it excels at that. For day-to-day coding, either in very small teams or for individuals on their own, it's not an appropriate tool, in my opinion. But hey, what do I know? All right, to give uh, Paddy a bit of a rest, um, I'll I'll finish off the feedback from Nathan D. Smith, who gives a little bit of um, background on Joyent that we covered in the last show. And he says... I'm glad you mentioned the Joyent acquisition by Samsung in your last show. Joyent's Triton is based on Illumos, which is a fork of Open Solaris. You should know that Triton is open source and can be deployed as your own private cloud infrastructure. When Oracle acquired Sun, much of Sun's operating systems engineers quit and some started Illumos as a continuation of the Open Solaris project. Illumos includes Solaris goodies like ZFS and DTrace and has a few notable distributions. OmniOS for servers... Open Indiana, which is a desktop environment, and SmartOS for virtualization. SmartOS is a product of Joyent, as the operating system which runs Triton and Manta. So why would Samsung go to Triton for cloud infrastructure when Linux rules the world? Triton has several modes of virtualization, including running zones, Linux containers, and KVM. So you can deploy Linux containers and VMs on Triton. This is probably the most significant advancement for a non-Windows, non-Linux data center technology in quite a while, and will be pretty interesting to keep an eye on now that they have a lot more resources behind it. So I did have to uh, cut down part of Nathan's description there. He gave a really good long summary that's available on the website from the last show notes. Um, But I think that gets the point across of it is something that is sort of different to what we normally cover because it's non-Linux, but it's also non-Windows, you know, non-Mac. And it's just interesting to see that Samsung have gone in this direction, which seems, well, from this description, it seems quite uh, off the beaten path. Well, it seems like Samsung never really wants to do things the standard way. They always want to invent it there, don't they? Like even with Android, they've never really done Android the standard way. They've always put their horrible skin on it or their really good skin, depending on your viewpoint. I think mine's quite clear. And now they're going for Tizen. So it's not really a huge surprise, is it, that they're looking to do the back-end stuff in a different way? They kind of feel that they're better than everyone else, maybe, except Apple, who they just copy. <laughs> yeah, but I, I see what you mean. I mean, who says that the way that um, Google is doing something or, or the fact that everyone else is using Linux, who says that necessarily the best thing? Because, you know, a number of years ago, Linux maybe wasn't the best solution for certain aspects and it's improved why wouldn't this you know triton improve or or why hasn't joyent got something that people are able to to build upon especially with samsung's backing it's really going to push them forward so um as nathan says here it'd be interesting to see how that goes and whether um joyent's sort of output in software becomes something that competes in certain areas against linux well that'll do it for the feedback then let's move on and talk about suza studio Just over a month ago, we received an email from someone called Sam about his project, which is called Gecko Linux, which he said is a spin of OpenSUSE. And would we like to check it out? And he's asked us before and we ignored him. And so I thought, I'll check this out. And so I went to his GitHub page and had a look at the download page. And there were all the desktops, as far as I could see, Cinnamon, XFCE, GNOME, KDE, LXQ, Budgie, Marte, and I thought, mm, I'll have a look at the XFCE one, I suppose. And I thought, well, mm, it's okay. It had a few problems, and I sent him back an email detailing those problems. And we had a back and forth about the various problems, and he fixed some of them, and this back and forth went on and on. And one of my big criticisms of it was that it's using SUSE Studio And I thought, well, anyone can do that. Anyone can just use SUSE Studio to slap a few things together and it would be really easy. And so I suggested to you guys, let's have a look at SUSE Studio and prove me right that it's easy. Anyone can do this. And quickly regretted it because it is not easy at all. And suddenly the respect that I had for Sam increased dramatically 
And I realised the effort that he'd put in was quite considerable. Now, is this because Sousa Studio isn't very good? Is it because putting a distro together is actually quite hard? Or is it because Sousa is just not a very good thing to base a distro on? <laughs> all very good questions, Paddy. And I think that the truth lies somewhere in all of that. I think that Sousa Studio is very powerful. I think that we can agree on. And I think that because it's powerful, it is necessarily a difficult thing to use. You can't expect something to be easy if it's got all these different options and all these ways to put a distro together. And also, yeah, I think putting a distro together is difficult. Yeah, I mean, it's the classic phrase, with great power comes great complexity. And it <laughs> is complicated. What? <laughs> 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 With power comes responsibility. You're just making it up. Uh, we can make them up how we like. It's fine. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway, carry on. So, I mean, it, there are a lot of options. Of course, there are. You know, just just selecting the the uh, the basis on which you want to build your desktop is there's there's a whole myriad. So there's one, two, three, four, seven different versions of SUSE you can choose from. Each of which has three, if not four, desktops. So either absolute minimum, server edition, or GNOME or KDE. So you've got a myriad to choose from from the outset. And then you go on to build how you want it to boot, how you want software to work within it, whether you want to run scripts at first boot, whether you want to run scripts every single time, whether there's additional things. And all these things need to be considered because I think if you made it super dumb and super minimalistic, uh, not only would you not be able to sort of make your own stamp on it and tweak it how you like, you also wouldn't get the sort of the granularity that you need to, to make what it is that you're maybe seeing in your mind. So clearly Sam had used OpenSUSE or some other distributions and decided that he wanted something slightly different or wanted to see if he could make a distribution to his own tweaking. And this is, well, this is the one best first step at doing this. If you're not um a very experienced programmer or you know have a team behind you or what have you it will be difficult to make your own distribution and SUSE studio is is a good first step because it it does line all these things up and it gives you all the tools that you need to do it so i i see what you're saying joe about it being uh you know complicated about it, there being a lot of options but i kind of feel that you need that number of options because if there's any fewer it wouldn't be able to to deliver the granularity you need to make the desktop you want to see. Oh, I completely agree. It needs to be this complicated, otherwise it wouldn't have any value. The value lies in its complexity. But the flip side of that is it's not something... You, well, put it this way, you can't expect to create a polished distro in an afternoon with this thing. Certainly, I didn't manage to. You know, I, I spent a few afternoons with this and still managed to make something that wouldn't even properly boot the way I wanted it to. A, a sort of Franken-distro. Yeah, well, I mean, I tried to just keep it simple. I tried to create an XFCE distro that would boot to the desktop and log me in as me with the applications that I wanted installed out of the box. And you'd think that would be simple, but it was much more complicated than I had suspected it would be. I'm fascinated to know how this is more complicated because I was surprised how easily I could get a bootable desktop with what I wanted. Uh, so we'll, we'll maybe go through the steps of how it is that you you start this. So it's a case of obviously going to the OpenSUSE website and they have uh, obviously the downloads for Leap and the other one. Tumbleweed. Thank you. And they also, as you go further down, they suggest that you can use Kiwi, but Kiwi is just the back end for SUSE Studio, and that's not what you want. You want to go for, straight to the SUSE Studio website, and you log in. So I logged in with my Google account. It's got a whole load of options for how it allows you to log in with various different accounts, so that's quite useful. And then you're basically straight into what you want to name it and what you want to base it on. And once you've selected what you're going to base it on and when you've picked a name, it gives you a number of tabs. So there's start, software, configuration, files, build and share. And start is, you know, fairly obvious as, as to what the very um, foundation is. is. And then you move on to the software tab and that's where you pick what 
it already has pre-installed because if you selected the GNOME desktop, it would have obviously GNOME. It's got various things like Vim, uh, Network Manager, things like this. Whereas if you've gone for maybe the minimalistic one, it would have a very minimalistic small number of applications. Yes, and that's where it gets complicated. If you are not a traitor like you using the GNOME desktop, if you want a proper one like XFCE, that is not available as a predefined you know, uh, set of packages. You have to manually select all of the relevant XFCE packages that you want or try and dig through and find meta packages for some of it. And then you need to have uh, the display manager and that's where it gets complicated for me is finding all of the, the the software that you actually need to make one of the non-mainstream desktops actually work. But I didn't actually try the GNOME or KDE. I assume that that gives you a pre-configured, very easy to use ISO or more or less straight away, really. Yeah, it does. So I spent my time messing around with what applications I wanted added, uh, removing Vim, because who uses that, and then making sure that I could sort of, uh, I don't know, things that I wouldn't necessarily do for a desktop that I wanted. Uh, I made Clementine boot at start, for example, just to see, to make sure that these things did work. I made sure that it uh, logged in automatically. And these things did eventually, when I when I got the ISO down and installed, did all work so those the things that you set up you know it's not like they say it will work and it falls over i was getting clementine starting at boot even though no one obviously wants that really you know you're talking about an iso there i mean that's not necessarily the end result here is it because you can get it running quite happily uh virtualized on their servers to, to try it out online if you like before you go anywhere near any sort of installable media well yeah that's primarily what i did using their test drive function which I found to be very, very useful. It means that it saves you the hassle of downloading it, DD in it, booting it. it. You can just boot it straight away in the browser. And um, you, you also don't have to produce just an ISO. You can produce VMware and send guest images and that kind of thing. So, I mean, that, for me, betrays what this is really about. This is not really about building a desktop distro, is it? This is more for producing cloud builds that are tailored to exactly what you want and are going to work on vmware or whatever it is whatever hypervisor you're using yeah agreed um just going back to test drive that you touched on there you get an hour to test it so you can make sure that all the things that you've set up maybe the various uh boot scripts and things are all work but did you not find it very clunky i've used ubuntu on the web and i've been surprised at how smooth they allow you to try that out but actually test drive i thought was was quite yeah well quite clunky quite sort of uh difficult to use smoothly you're talking about response time because i found using the whole scissor studio thing it was fairly sluggish most of the time and i guess that's just because they're not providing masses of hardware behind the scenes to power it yeah response time and, and now you mentioned the whole website absolutely it, it was a it took a little while to refresh things and when you added applications it would it would auto find uh, dependencies if you pick an application that has three or four other things that it relies on it would pull those in as well but it did take a little while to to note those and, and tick them in the list of pre-installed applications and that's sort of maybe where i was a bit surprised at joe saying that it was difficult to install xfce because i had thought that when you picked xfce it would have pulled in and auto installed all of the other dependencies xfce has so i was, I was surprised that it was as difficult as it was joe well, I wouldn't go so far as to say it was difficult. Maybe I said that in error. It was just time-consuming and um, you know, not as simple as just one checkbox. It required a bit of searching through. And also, it wasn't sort of configured how I wanted it. I then had to think about uploading some config files to get my panel where I wanted it, that sort of thing. So is that using the, the the files tab? Because you can pre-populate your distribution with files. And I have to admit, I used it fairly simplistically just to make sure it worked, put some pictures and MP3s up there so that I could test that it actually worked when it got to it. But but you were loading configuration files into the appropriate location so that when you booted, it had them preset. Well, I was trying to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, speaking of this test drive thing, I was um, using this on Chrome on my test laptop, and I've just gone, I haven't got Chrome installed on this laptop. I've just gone to it in Chromium, 
And there's a big thing that says, Flash, you need Flash Player to run Test Drive in your browser. So uh, mm, that's a little bit disappointing because I've definitely seen similar things using HTML5 stuff. So they're a little bit behind the times there. But I suppose you can't complain. This is all free stuff. So uh, yeah, just an interesting note to me anyway. So as a general sort of idea, do you think it's a good one? I mean, do you think allowing people to create customized distros for themselves should be encouraged? Or do you think it's one of those things that, I mean, we're forever talking about Ubuntu, say, and the fact that there are a thousand distros out there that are based on Ubuntu that are nothing but a change of wallpaper and something else. Does this fall into the same sort of category that it's actually not adding anything to the ecosystem or because of the server side of things, as Jesse was suggesting, it could actually be quite a time saver? Well, I think it could definitely be a time saver. And I think that it's a good introduction, isn't it? To It gives you a glimpse and an idea of what goes into putting a distro together. And you don't have to worry about the build servers or anything like that. You just set it going and wait about 20 minutes-ish and then you've got your ISO ready to test and or download and, and distribute if you want. So I think it's it's a good tool for people to learn a little bit more about this stuff. But I do see your, your point, Paddy, that potentially you're going to end up with loads of distros that don't have a, a huge amount of value. But I think I'm going to try and be a bit more optimistic on this. And I think that it will probably put off people who think that it's easy, like me. You know, I went into this thinking, oh, it'd be easy, I'll just create a distro and, it, you know, anyone can do that. But then when you realize the hard work that goes into it and that needs to go into it, maybe it will put off those kind of fly-by-night, johnny come lateies, and it will encourage those who are seriously dedicated and willing to put a lot of time into it. See, I heard Paddy's question slightly differently. I, I figured that this was a case of making a distro personalized, so just for yourself. Uh, so I've no doubt that um, Sam has learned a lot from the process of trying to make a bootable, workable distribution. And like you said, Joe, the number of different flavors, let's say, that he brought out and the different desktop environments. It's good that he's kept at it, and I've no doubt that he's learned a lot from it. But I wouldn't have thought this as a way of making a distribution or multiple distributions that you try and get onto Distro Watch because anyone could go and mimic exactly what you've done by going to the website, ticking the same boxes, loading the same um, drivers or, or configuration files and things, and making exactly the same thing. I would see this as a way of uh, those people who maybe get the Ubuntu minimal ISO and then build everything on top of that to make the exact distribution just how they like it or maybe even Arch, which is you know uh, based on that very that very premise, it would be a way of being able to start an open SUSE distribution absolutely tailored to you. And because you can keep it on their website, it I assume it would auto update when their base packages update, and you could you know just remake it and tweak your configuration files should you learn a new way of doing things, or you you maybe change the way you use your distribution. And therefore, you have like a personalized version of OpenSUSE rather than one that you would publish on the web and try and compete with Mint and Arch and all those other big distributions. I think you're right there. I think that definitely is the purpose of this. But I don't think that it is necessarily for desktop stuff. As I said, I think it is for server and cloud appliances, basically. And SUSE as a, you know, a company, a commercial company, are trying to encourage people to start using SUSE with this and it's a, I think it's a very good marketing tool for them to you know they obviously have a lot of faith in what SUSE is doing and, and the technologies and everything that are available there so I think that in in terms of attracting people to use OpenSUSE and then potentially you know the enterprise edition I think it's a very good strategy by them so to wrap this up then normally I would ask are we going to continue to use the thing that we're talking about and it looks like well no because none of us use OpenSUSE but if you are an OpenSUSE user I love saying that um, it seems to me like this would be a great thing to have a look at to customize it how you want it to be and get your own custom spin of it and definitely if you are using OpenSUSE on servers then I would highly recommend that you check it out and 
build your own distro, well, you know, your own version of OpenSUSE that is absolutely catered to your needs. But with that, we're coming to the end of another Linux Luddites. You can email us at show at linuxluddites.com, find us on Twitter at Linux Luddites, or at the Google Plus and Facebook communities, or you can leave a comment on the website. Thanks for joining me, Paddy and Jesse, and thanks to everyone for listening. We'll see you again in two weeks with more Linux news, reviews, comment, and generally being grumpy. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, party people. <laughs> see you later. <laughs>